I'm going to be here with my good buddy David, and we've got some uh, special announcements we're going to talk about to get us set up for this coming season of just being generous and giving. Uh, one of the things that we do every Tuesday in our staff meeting is we start off with prayer. And we used to go around the room and everybody would say, you know, their prayer request, and then we stopped doing that. And we learned to just sit and listen and let the Lord speak to us. And then as God would guide us, we pray. And we do that every Tuesday. And then one Tuesday, something wonderful happened with all of our staff. We started thinking about our status right now as far as the church. And we started being very grateful for the fact that God has given us a wonderful place to worship. And then we challenged each other about our faith in Jesus Christ as it relates to how generous are we as a team. And here's where we landed on two verses. One comes out of uh, John chapter uh, 21 verse 25 and another one out of Ephesians. I'm going to start with the Ephesians verse first. It says, now unto him who is able to do immeasurably above all we ask or think according to his power that's at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And then at the end of Christ's journey with his disciples, the, the apostle John writes this. He says in uh, John 21, 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. And we just marveled at that because think about it this way. When you think Jesus is going to do one thing, he does exceedingly abundantly above all of that. And we as a staff have watched him work through this new vision we've been rolling out to you. And we've talked about how Jesus Christ has really brought us together as a church, as a staff. And this is something we can all be a part of. We are becoming and are Jesus centered everything. Well, David went to a conference and the conference brought back even more revelation to us. So I'm going to let you share about that. Yeah. So I think one of the things that uh, we tend to not be very good at as a church is celebration. Uh, knowing how to party and have a good time uh, and knowing uh, just recognizing God's faithfulness. And so as we were um, as we were praying over these things, I just, I, I got a sense that maybe we should celebrate a little bit more. Uh, maybe we should be looking at the faithfulness of God through our, through our congregation, through uh, what God's doing through all of us together on this side of Fort Wayne, across the city and across the world. And um, we recognize that celebra celebration um, builds things. Celebration builds values. It builds relationships and it builds organizations, which is us as a church. And, and so we want to be, become, as we're stepping into this uh, holiday season with Thanksgiving and Christmas, we want to be a church that uh, celebrates a little more, that has a little more fun, that, that uh, recognizes what God's doing and celebrates that together. Um, so that's kind of where we landed in our prayer time. Um, it's just that we want to we wanna just recognize God's faithfulness and know that he is good and celebrate those things. Well, and listen, we've got a lot to celebrate. And I'm going to run through a laundry list of things that not only the staff got to celebrate, but you guys get to celebrate with us because you are the people who came alongside this church and pulled off all of these wonderful things. You're going to, you're going to remember some of these as I go through it. First of all, how about our vision? The fact that we now have a simplified vision that all of us can be a part of, we can memorize it, learn it, and actually do it. Um, and we are. We are just being Jesus-centered, everything people, and that's just wonderful. How about the fact that we went through a whole tough time of COVID, and in about a month, we were able to pull off an online presence. So all of you that are watching online, thank you so much for being with us. And man, isn't that just powerful that our reach now is just not on Sunday morning, but it goes all across the world to anybody that wants to tune in. How about the fact that we have partnerships? You remember 410. We asked you guys to give toward that effort, and not only did we reach that goal, but we exceeded that goal because of the generosity of all of you guys who come every single Sunday. 
And then how about also the partnerships that we've been able to connect with? NeighborLink. We have now our church going into neighborhoods and helping out all over the city to get things accomplished. How about Serving Simply? We had Doug Stitt on stage, and he and Josh brought uh, Serving Simply to us. And now every Saturday, families get to plug in, go downtown, and get blessed by helping somebody else. What a wonderful deal. And then we're going to forge some new partnerships. We have one that's called New Mercies. You might remember it as Safe Families and now it's New Mercies. And we're partnering up with them to be able to help give foster kids an opportunity and those foster parents a chance to just get some respite and be supportive to them. I've got more for you. How about some of the internal ministries that we started? We started, David, our community life groups. And I know you say, well, we had those all the time. No, 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 no. Not like we have them now. We get this. We have so many people signing up, and this is a good thing. This isn't a complaint. We have so many people signing up for community life groups, we can't keep up. That means everybody wants to get plugged in. By the way, shameless plug, if you want to host a group, please contact me. I would love to be able to do that because I got more people than I do houses and buildings. So if you want to be a part of that, just let me know and I'll get you plugged into that. How about the fact that we still have our, our other groups, our ABF groups. We call those groups grow groups. We have men's group going on. We have women's group meeting all over this place. And that is just exciting, right? And then how about the fact that we revamped our entire kid ministry? We now have a next-gen pastor, and we are doing great things. I don't know if you've gone upstairs on Sunday morning. We're taking over the upstairs. Steve has revamped that whole area for our upper elementary kids, and then kid men is still going on. And, man, what a powerful thing. We hired a youth uh, pastor who's doing a great job with our youth, and so that's something to celebrate. How about the fact that our worship is now diverse? We thought about being intergenerational. David has worked so hard with his team to make sure that we're bringing different kinds of worship experiences to this stage, and we want to continue to do that. Got a couple of more for you. How about marriage mentoring? Partnering up with Brooke Sailhorn and having her teach our, our couples how to mentor younger couples. That's going on. How about all the funerals and weddings that we do around this place that's just absolutely outstanding right here at Brookside. You think I'm done, right? Nope. Got a couple of more for you. We still got other stuff that we can celebrate. How about the fact that BSF did not meet in this place for an entire year? Now you come here on Wednesday mornings and these ladies literally use every nook and cranny that they can get. If there's a little nook right here in front of this stage, they're there, right? How many women come to BSF and know I'm telling the truth? Yes, it's all over the place. And then we have one more that we're really excited about. We had a a young man come and meet with me, and he said, hey, listen, I just got these young kids. I'm a former gang member. I got these young kids from the south side. They just want to play basketball, and I just want to speak into their life about what Jesus has done for me. And they meet out here every Monday, all the way from the south side in our gym, and play basketball and learn skills about life right here at Brookside. I think that's something to celebrate. How about celebrating that with me? Amen. Amen. And so what we want to do is David's going to talk about now ways that we want to get you involved because we got so much more to do. We're not done with just getting started, right? Yeah, so I think as we enter this holiday season, uh, we want to enter it into, uh, into it with celebration like we mentioned, but also with faith. Um, because we believe God is bigger than uh, budget. God is bigger than our limitations. Um, there's so much room for faith here in this place. And um, the, the biggest thing I think that we, we talked about in our staff meeting when we were praying is how cool would it be if we could pay off our mortgage in 2021? Right now, I think we're set to, to pay it off in 2022. But imagine if the people of God came together and paid off this debt in 2021 uh, or 22. Actually, we are in 2020. Yeah, we're in 20, yeah. 21. Yeah. We'll, I forget we'll what year I'm in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but imagine how cool that Talk would be. Talk about if we reach. Just, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> if we just had faith in God that he would provide that. Um, because we, we were talking about ways that we want to use this facility yes. to reach our community. Um, but because of our, uh, our mortgage over top of our head, there's a lot of limitations that we have. And so with faith, we just want to believe that that mortgage can be gone in 2022. And um, some of the things we talked about, um, just from a, 
from a facility standpoint that we'd like to do next year is, is find ways for people to use our property, uh, even if the doors aren't open. So that's basketball hoops. That's um, a dog park, which sounds really silly. But if you come here at 830 any day of the week, there's probably five to ten people walking their dogs around here. And I, we just think that'd be really cool. Uh, playground, splash pad, like there's just so many different things that we could do. Um, and so we just, as we're entering this season of, of the holiday season, and we just looking forward to the next year, we're just believing big things. Um, and we want you to believe with us um, that God is going to do some awesome things here at Brookside in 2022. Amen. And listen, believing is just not saying in your head, you believe it's taking action. We are calling our church to action to be able to do, have God do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We want to saturate our communities with the gospel. And the only way that you do the gospel is by going. Jesus didn't say stay. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We want to go into these communities right around us. And make this place a place where people say this is a beacon of hope and light for everybody because they really do believe in saturating communities with the gospel. So we're going to do what we're calling in December a day of giving. And what I want you to do is the day of giving isn't just your normal giving. We want you to start praying about how you can be generous on this particular day. Think of whatever it is the Bible says upon the first day of the week, let you decide within your heart what you're going to give and then let you give that. We're asking you to start that prayer time early. Start letting God talk to you about how we can. Wouldn't it be awesome to get on this stage this time next year and say, you know what? That mortgage meant nothing to us. We wiped that thing right out. We got rid of it. And we're able to do all those cool things. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite you. We're not going to get up and pray for you. We're going to do just like we do in our staff meeting. We're going to invite you right where you are to just take a moment. And listen, this isn't a pressure moment for me. You let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Whether you're giving your time, whether you're giving your talent, whether you're giving your treasure, or maybe you've got a testimony. Whatever you're thinking about as far as being generous, that's what we want you to be praying about. Lord, how can I? Be generous in this place. And so I'm going to give everybody a moment right now to bow your head. And you just take a moment and you pray. And you ask God to start speaking to your heart about how he wants you to give. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, my name is Eric Dubal, and again, welcome all of you watching online right now. Really good to have you with us. Um, I'm so happy to be the lead pastor of Brookside Church. I just want to welcome you to this place. Welcome to the family. If you're looking for a church home, we really would love for you to stop looking because we think you can make this place better and vice versa. So please let that invitation sink into your family and come and be a part of what God's doing here, okay? Hey, uh, let me tell you what's going on today and then coming up, all right? So today we're actually finishing our time in what's called the Beatitudes. If you've been with us for the last couple of months, you know we've been focusing our time really in Matthew chapter five, verse one through 12. Today we're gonna finish that up. Now in verse 13, Matthew 5, 13, we're gonna pick that up again but not until January, okay? The first week of January. Next week starts a brand new sermon series. It's a smaller series, but what we've been asking is, you know, what does it actually look like? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And so we've had on a whiteboard this question, what is a portrait of a Jesus follower? And so you could put all kinds of answers in that question. There's a lot of different lists and stuff, but as we've talked about it as a leadership team, we've asked the question, what does that really mean for us in a way that's digestible? it's not a list of like 18 different points that you've got to memorize. No, no, it's, it's a way that we can all understand it and embrace it. And so we've actually come up with four ideas, four concepts uh, that we believe describes what a Jesus follower is. And you know what? As every pastor needs, they're all T's, okay? Uh, they all start with T's. Let me just kind of talk to you about it. It's, it's time. How does a follower of Jesus spend their time? It's the talents. What has God given you? Your gifts, your skill sets, your personality. How do you use those for his glory? So it's your time, your talents. It's also your treasure. That's what Pastor Ewell and David were talking about a minute ago. How do we use the resources God has given us to further his kingdom and honor and glorify him by the way we spend our money? And the last one is this. It's our testimony. Every one of us has a story. 
Every one of us has a story that God is involved in, God has created, and God wants to use to bring other people into the kingdom of God. And so it's our time, our talent, treasures, and our testimony. And I cannot wait over the next four weeks to carry those conversations with you guys so that all of us can sink into what a follower of Jesus really looks like and how a follower of Jesus lives. And then after that, it's Christmas, okay? So we're gonna have a great time as all of you buy me presents and stuff, and as all of, and as I say, hey, Merry Christmas to you. So uh, I hope you guys have a great Christmas as you plan for that, all right? And then in January, we'll jump back into the Sermon on the Mount, all right? But today, let's finish up the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12, okay? Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12. Now, as you're turning there, let me tell you something I learned this week, all right? I read an article, uh, and it's a study from the psychological world on how people become happy. Uh, they, they decided that there's really three conditions that help a person become a happy person. The first on that list is the quality of your close relationships. So it's not just that you have friends, it's that you have such close friendships that you know and can share each other's secrets and confidentiality. So that's, that's quality friendship. It's not just that you have a spouse, but that there's a deep love and a deep contentment within the marriage. So on the top of that list is a condition of the quality of your close relationships. Next to that is the second condition, and that is that you have a job that you love and that is challenging to you. So this is not a paycheck to you. When you wake up in the morning, you look forward to going to your work. And when you are there, it's not some mediocre, boring task that you cannot wait to be done every single day. No, no, when you are there, your mind is challenged. It's stimulated. The passions in you are arisen. And when you produce a product, whatever that result is, you can see the net gain for the community with that result. Man, that's, that's the second condition. The third, though, rounding out the list, it's the condition of being a philanthropic person, philanthropic person. Whether that's doing some random acts of kindness for your neighbor or volunteering at the animal shelter down the street, that's philanthropy. In fact, yesterday morning, about a dozen people from our community life group, we, we got on that NeighborLink website that we've been pushing you guys to, and we, we checked out a job that's really close to uh, Indiana Tech. And the lady that we met there, she's elderly, but I mean, she's a sweetheart. She loves Jesus, but she does have a sickness in her. And so that created some hoarding. And so we walked in that house and it is junk everywhere. So for four hours, our group spent time cleaning up her house, getting it ready that's more livable for her. And I gotta tell you, man, we, we loved it. As much as that blessed her, every one of us in our community life group that was there, man, we came away happy because of that. We're more than happy to spend four hours doing that for her. So when I read this list from that, that study, I'm like, you know what? Maybe, they, maybe they're onto something. The quality of my close relationships, the fact that I love my job and it, it challenges me and that I can be philanthropic, apparently those are gonna make me more happy than the average person. Now, maybe a surprise to you, there's one condition that didn't make the list. And that is simply this, outside of your basic needs being met, money didn't really play any role at all in your happiness. So what this means is if those first three conditions are true in your life, you could be happier driving around in your 10-year-old pickup truck than the billionaire flying around in his private jet. And as soon as you hear that, you responded just like I did. I'm like, you know what, I don't disagree with that, but you know, give me a chance to figure that out for myself, okay? <laughs> and I will tell you where I'm at with my happiness, you know? Now, here's the thing, guys. Uh, I really admire the psychological world. I admire the medical community, the scientific community. I admire all of those communities because I love the thoroughness of their research. I really do. And I would love to have even more of a researching mind like they do. So I, I'm not trying to in any way degrade that, but here's what's interesting. The way that I hear the psychological world telling me to be happy is not what I read in Matthew 5. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In Matthew chapter five, and specifically the Beatitudes that we've been studying for the last two months, one word is used nine different times. It's the word blessed. You'll see that at every verse, blessed, blessed, blessed. It's used nine times. And you learned a lot about what that meant last week when Pastor Yule preached on this, but the word is makarios. It translates as supremely happy, overwhelmingly happy. 
So here's what I'm learning. The psychological world is telling me there's a way to be happy. And Matthew 5 is telling me there's a way to be happy. But when I read Matthew 5, I'm not seeing the same conditions that the psychological world is telling me. For example, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, let's just take verse 3 and 4 together. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. Let me translate these for you. Supremely happy overwhelmingly happy are those who recognize they have nothing to offer God. There is nothing inherent to yourself that God looks at and says, man, is that impressive? Can I get your autograph? No, it's not happening. Verse four, supremely happy and overwhelmingly happy are those who recognize and feel the weight of sin on their life and their innocence that was stolen because of it. You're happy when you are there. And when I translate it like that, I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not at all the kind of conditions that that article just taught me about. So now I'm still confused. What is happiness and how do I get it? And then the thought occurred to me. What if both the psychological, medical, and, and, and uh, healthcare communities and Matthew chapter 5 are both Right? What if they're both right? What if they're both right, but it's just that they're both talking about two different kinds of happiness? What if the psychological community uses the word happy and it's accurate in its descriptions, but what if the Greek translators of the Bible, the Greek writers, what if they just didn't have a word deep enough and powerful enough and enduring enough and strong enough to describe the kind of blessings that you read in chapter five? What if the kind of happiness that Matthew's talking about is so deep and so powerful that they didn't have language to describe it. So what if the difference between the two happinesses is the difference between a trickle of water from the psychological world and Niagara Falls in Matthew 5? What if that's the difference? And if this is true, guys, this changes the way I read Matthew 5. It changes the way I approach it because now I'm not reading Matthew 5 from a circumstantial point of view. By the way, that's all the psychological world taught me about. If I have quality relationships, I can be happy. If I have a great job, I can be happy. And if I can serve in places, I can be happy. But here's the thing. At some point, all of that or some of that can all go away. Then goes my happiness. It's circumstantial and it's surface level. Matthew 5 is taking me deep and it's describing a raging undercurrent that flows beneath all of the surface level circumstances. It leaves untouched by anything going on in our life around us. So all the circumstances around our life might not produce that kind of happiness, but Matthew 5 takes us to a current underneath it all. And when I realized that, it changed the way I read Matthew 5. And what it did, check this out. It changed the emphasis of every single verse. Let me tell you what I mean. For those of us who are familiar with the Beatitudes, whenever we recite them, we only recite the first part of the verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. We forget the second part. So what we do is we begin to believe that our happiness, our blessing comes from only being poor in spirit. We think it only comes from mourning. And if you understand the language, that's circumstantial surface level conditions. What we forget is the second part of every verse. Verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit for they will receive the kingdom of heaven. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And all of a sudden I realize that the blessing, the supreme happiness, the overwhelming happiness that Jesus is inviting me into, it is not when I am poor in spirit. It's when I receive the kingdom on the other side of it. I am not supremely happy when I am mourning. I am supremely happy when I receive the comfort that only God can give that my soul is desperately craving. That's when I'm happy. And so now I realize 
The Beatitudes are a gateway into the kind of happiness that only comes from God and only comes if you first go through the first part of the verse. So I'll never have the kingdom of heaven unless I am first poor in spirit. I will never have the comfort my soul craves unless I first mourn. When you see the Beatitudes that way, not only can you see the depth of the happiness that our language cannot get to, but you can see the pattern of the kingdom moving. And if this is true for verse three and four, it's true in verses 10 through 12 as well. And then it makes sense. Listen to verse 10 through 12. Listen to what it says. Blessed are those who are persecuted. According to that psychological study, that's not true. But if you keep reading, it becomes true. Because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That doesn't sound like it's gonna bring me happiness, but keep reading. Rejoice and be glad, verse 12 says, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Guys, there's a thought that I, I came up with as a result of this. It goes sim- it's gonna be on the screen. It goes simply like this. The depth of your happiness in your soul and spirit is proportionate to the level of spiritual pain you're willing to endure. The level of happiness is proportionate to the level of pain you're willing to endure. In other words, if you're not willing to go through that kind of pain, you're never gonna experience that reward. In fact, let me tell you about this. You and I have a ton of spiritual ancestors in the faith who've experienced that kind of pain. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, the author takes an entire chapter to describe these people. The first parts of the chapter, you know some of these people by name. And the author goes into specific detail about how these people, through faith, did amazing things. As they lived out faith in Jesus, in their world, what God did through them and for them and in them. Towards the end of the chapter, though, it's like he runs out of ink where he runs out of paper, or he runs out of time. In fact, he says this, I don't have time to tell you about all these other people. In fact, that's verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. He doesn't have time to do that, but here's what he does do. He summarizes the results of their faithfulness. Verse 33, who through faith conquered kingdoms. How many of us would love to conquer kingdoms in faith, right? Administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. You know who he's talking about right there? Like Daniel, who when he was under the rule of the king of Babylon, he refused to bow down and worship other gods. And so because of that, he was thrown in the lion's den. Remember what happened? He did not get eaten. The next morning, they pulled him out fully alive. Man, that can be the result of faithfulness, right? But keep reading, verse 34. Who quenched the fury of the flames. Who's he talking about? What about like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who refused to worship and bow down to the idol. And so they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But as they looked in the furnace, I mean, the furnace was so hot, it actually killed the guards who put him in there. But as they looked into that furnace, they didn't just see those three guys, they saw a fourth guy, turns out to be an angel protecting them. When they pulled the three guys out, not even a hair on their head was singed or the smell of smoke on them. This is what can happen when you and I show faithfulness. Keep reading. And escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Verse 35, women received back their dead, raised to life again. What faithfulness in God can do, the result of that can be miraculous. Can you see this? But keep reading, verse 35b. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. 
They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them, and these were all commended for their faith. You know what I learned about Hebrews chapter 11? When you decide to live by faith in Jesus Christ, God can do the miraculous, but you can also experience the persecution. You know what? You don't know what's going to happen. When they threw Daniel in the lion's dead, he had no idea that in the morning he'd still be alive. But yet God intervened and made him alive. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, they had no idea that they would survive those flames. They had no idea an angel was going to show up and save them. They thought, as soon as I hit those flames, we're gone, right? When you and I live by faith, we don't know if we're going to see the miraculous or the persecution. We don't know. Here's what's interesting. God never tells us. What he does do is ask us to be faithful. And whether it's by his miraculous work in our life or it's our experience in persecution, one, we are still commended for our faith and number two, he still gets the glory. And when you get there, Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12 comes alive. What I wanna do is for my remaining time, I wanna show you, first of all, what causes us to experience persecution? And number two, what's required of us to step into that world? Um, I, uh, I'm an Ohio State fan, if you can't tell. Listen, when I watch Ohio State play, there's like these dreams that kind of come alive in me. Like, what if I was the quarterback? I mean, you think this is just a jersey. This is the actual jersey I used when I was quarterback of Ohio State that you guys don't know about. So I'm just thinking, man, what if I could be quarterback and I could get that game-winning touchdown or, you know, even as slow as I am, I could fake everybody out and I could run it in myself and get that touchdown. How awesome would that be? So I'm envisioning these dreams of like glory and prestige and fame and all these kinds of things. But you know what I forget about? You know what I don't think about when I have those kind of dreams? It's about five feet away from me. Our four linemen who are all 300 pounds solid muscle can all run faster than me. And I see their eyes of just hate bearing down on me. And they're like, all I want to do is just break your body in half, right? So I literally, as soon as I get that ball as quarterback, have two seconds, two seconds to throw it or run it before one or all of those monsters come and make me a pancake. So when I think about that, you know what it does? It's like, ah, I'm okay to not play in the game. I'd rather live. So here, here's what I'm saying, guys. As much as I want the glory of the quarterback, as much as I want the fame of the touchdown pass, I'm not interested in having any of that because I don't want to deal with getting tackled. So what this means is as I'm sitting on the bench or on my couch, whoever that team is playing against, they're not worried about me. And so even though they might be like, okay, he's an Ohio State fan or Ohio State player, you know what? Uh, they're not really watching me at game day because they don't care about me. You know why? Because I'm not a threat to them. But as soon as I get in the game and I show the enemy how I'm going to use my time, how I'm going to use my talent, my treasures and my testimony, all of a sudden I become a first string quarterback for my team. And now I make the enemy scared. Amen. And then what he's going to do to me is start attacking. He's going to focus his linemen on me and say, that's your target. If you can stop him, you can stop the team. If you can stop that throw, you can stop their win. So many of us love Jesus, man. I'm so glad you do. But so many of us are on the bench. 
It's not that we don't want the kingdom to win. It's not that we don't want Jesus' name to be made famous and to grow in power and authority. It's not that we don't believe that the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's not that we don't believe that Jesus has given us authority. He has. He said, I'm giving you, Peter, the keys to the kingdom, keys to bind things and keys to loose things. You have authority in the domain that God has given you. Even if it's just your home, man, you've got authority. But even though all of that is true, so many of us are like, I don't want to get in the game because I'm afraid of the tackle. I'm afraid of the pain. Listen to it, guys. Your level of reward, your level of happiness is proportionate to the level and depth of pain you're willing to endure. If you're willing to go through those tackles, you can get the touchdowns. This is the way it works, not in football, but in our faith. I want to show you what this means. One day, Jesus... He sent his disciples out and, and he sent them out. The Bible says two by two. And this comes to us in Matthew chapter 10, just five chapters later. I want to read it to you, okay? He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority. You hear it? Gave them authority. Those disciples, they're just regular Joes like me and you. And in Jesus, we have the same authority that Jesus gave them. Listen to it. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Can you imagine having that kind of authority? As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do you have that kind of spirit in you? Do you have that kind of power and that kind of authority resonant in you? But listen to what he says. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. Listen to what will happen to them. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, I'm not willing to be arrested, are you? Listen, I'm happy to preach to you, but as soon as they say, sorry, if you preach on that stage, I'm gonna arrest you, that might give me a little bit of pause. You know what I mean? When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now listen to this. All men will hate you. All men will hate you. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Man, I'm so glad I've got that authority from Jesus. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm so glad he's given me the keys to the kingdom, power to bind things, power to loose things. I love it. I just don't love the pressure. I just don't love the insults. I don't love the fact that, I mean, I like, I like to make people happy if you know me at all. If I have to, if I can, I try to avoid conflict. I'm getting better at this, okay? But if somebody hates me, listen, that just keeps me up at night. I'm like, I got to fix this. And then Jesus says, all men is going to hate me. That's hard for me to deal with. So some of us might be prone to compromise our faith and to sit on the bench for the sake of the approval of men. Guys, I, th I, think, I think there's some things that we have to remember. Here's what's required for us. So what is required for us? If Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted, when you're insulted and hated by all men. What's required of us? Here's the first thing, guys. We have to want the approval of Jesus more than the approval of the jury. The jury is the culture. And the more you and I live for Jesus, the more you and I have faith in him, the more the culture is gonna hate us and oppose us and be hostile toward us. What we have to do is love the approval of Jesus way more than the approval of the jury. That's gonna create issues for us, guys. Number two, we have to risk the wolves if we want the reward. And number three, we have to remember our authority from Jesus when we feel discouraged by the world. We got, I mean, we're living in a world where the cards are stacked against us, church. And you and I have a choice. We get to live for Jesus or we get to live for the world. We can experience circumstantial happiness that the world tells us what that is and how to get it, or we can experience this deep, raging undercurrent of joy and contentment and peace and happiness that even though the circumstances on the surface are not preferable for that, underneath in our soul and in our spirit, man, are we 
happy. And that's a promise from scripture. I want to read to you a passage. It's actually a series of passages. Um, and I want to kind of put this in perspective for you. When Paul writes the second letter to the Corinthians, he addresses the kind of pain and persecution and insults and pressure that he is feeling. Let me read to some of these. Second Corinthians 1 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. 416, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. In verse nine and 10 of chapter 12, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, when I am insulted, when I am hated, when I am persecuted, then I am strong. Now, guys, this is hard for us because the reality is we are not experiencing, at least right now, the kind of persecution that those in chapter 11 of Hebrews experienced. Our property is not being taken away. Our lives are not at risk. Our ability to buy, buy things and spend money and stuff, that's not taken away from us. We have extremely low amounts of persecution, but there is something else that we can experience if you have faith in Jesus, that can either get you promoted at work because of your Christian integrity or it can get you fired. Because of your faith in Jesus, you can either get invited to the party because they love your character or you can be left out. Your platform, your influence, your voice, it can either be expanded because people love the heart that you have in Jesus or it can be shut down. There's all kinds of ways you and I can experience persecution and hate and those things. Here's what Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for yours is the kingdom and great is your reward in heaven. So let me pray for you. And what I wanna do guys is I wanna invite you to pray with me because I believe in this room right now, there are some of you who are you know, a couple people in here. One, you're having a hard time getting in the game. You're kind of nervous about the repercussions, the insults, the hate. Like, you know, I, I, it's good enough for me to believe in Jesus. It's good enough for me to say, I'm going to heaven. When Jesus said, no, no, I need you to get in the game. I need you to score some touchdowns for me. Maybe some of you need to get in the game, but some of you need to put your faith in Jesus for the first time because you recognize that your only hope and salvation is him. And the moment you say yes to Jesus, you become an enemy of Satan himself because now you have all of heaven, you have all of God, you have all of eternity in you. So I wanna pray for you and I wanna invite you to pray with me. And I'm gonna ask you to pray one of those prayers that God will give you the power and encouragement to get in the game, regardless of the pain and the tackles you'll experience in order to get touchdowns for the kingdom, or that you'll just say yes to Jesus. And so Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God that is so good to us. I pray that you bless us this morning. And for any of us who need to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in the game. It's time for me to get off the bench. And even though I'm gonna get tackled, even though I'm gonna get hurt, even though I'm gonna get flattened like a pancake, I cannot wait to see touchdowns scored for you. So Father, make us bold in the face of persecution. Make us strong in the face of insult. Make us resolved when all men hate us because of you. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's not yet given their life to Jesus today. I pray that this will be the moment because they believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to you. Nobody finds hope. Nobody gets saved except through him. And so Jesus, thank you for the cross. I pray that you will work that grace in our life because you say your grace is sufficient for us. 
May that not be something we just believe to get to heaven. May that be a lifestyle that in our weakness, because of you, we can be strong. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.